I'm the host, and the long wait is over. Welcome to the Kitchen Network, the last cooking competition on the planet. Among burning mountains and flooding coasts, we are alive. Among death, we still eat with our eyes and ears. We're out of resources, but we still have content. Three contestants are here to challenge each other in the ultimate test of culinary skill. In this final episode, our contestants will face each other for the title of Network Master. At stake is a special feature on Hashtag Food Talk, a headliner appearance at the next Foodverse, and the title of Network Master. The winner will also receive a grand prize of 100 Ethereum, provided by our sponsor, Pure and Clear, water from the last glaciers. Contestants, today you are back in our Kitchen Network HQ for our final showdown. By the end of this episode, one of you will be crowned Network Master. Now let's all welcome our judge, Aging Supermodel. Welcome to the final Kitchen Network Challenge. Kitchen Network family, as we move to the ends of content, oh, just a second, I forgot part of what I was going to say. Um, okay, yes, there was something I really wanted to do, which was, um, this is just our dress rehearsal. Um, I wanted to say thank you, disembodied judge voice, disembodied host voice. It is such an honor to share the metaphysical stage once again with the most important immaterial voice in the reality TV universe. And hello. To our Food Network Studio audience, family, give yourselves a hand. Give yourselves a big, beautiful hand. <laughs> louder, louder. You are beautiful. You are so special. You are amazing. Everything you do is amazing. We're so happy to have you here today as our studio audience. Just to let you know, what we've been thinking about here at the Kitchen Network. It's a very important last show, so we've put a lot of hard work into it. And we're feeling a little sad and a little happy. So just so you know, as we move towards the end of content, we are called upon to reflect on the nature of this show. Throughout my centuries, as an aging supermodel judge to the Kitchen Network, I have seen many remarkable moments. On this show, we have hosted the most talented, conceptual chefs of their generations. We have had the privilege to taste the rarest, most expensive ingredients from trees irrigated with glacier water from, this, from our sponsor, Pure and Clear, from golden potatoes harvested from the last soils of the earth, and grains of rice worth their weight in gold. Our contestants have demonstrated ancient techniques inspired by trending historical recipes from precious pizzas to elaborate frozen lasagnas to the best chocolate chip cookie on the planet. These recipes have, over the centuries, become much more than content. They've become portals through which we can appropriate and approximate other realities. The Kitchen Network has shown us that the first word of the reality TV vocabulary is truth, the main source of content. Therefore, to control the means of reality production, one must, first of all, control their own truth. They must know their own truth in order to be able to make it more expressive. We must cultivate the individual realities of our contestants to allow their true selves, 
to bubble and boil and spatter. It is only then that we will be able to practice forms of reality in which by stages we free ourselves from being simply users and gain the freedom to become producers. That we get that feeling, that special, inimitable reality TV feeling that we are not just consuming content, but we are producing it. Like our contestants here, all of them self-branding stars, truth, freedom, and the preciousness of the individual are the currencies of reality TV. Over this season, our contestants have been forced by the demands of our sponsors to wage fierce battles, pushing their culinary talent to the very limits and doing their best not to get eliminated forever. In this kitchen, in the cutthroat world of individual mastery, masterpieces have been created. New flavors from old worlds have been rediscovered and patented by our corporate sponsors. And new legends that steal stories from cultures around the world have been forged. Today, we're here to push our contestants to the limits of their truth and to see what they can cook up for us while the world is burning. And now that I have made myself seem so profound, let's meet our contestants and see if they can come anywhere close to being as charismatic as I am. Please come to your tables, contestants. So it's now my enormous pleasure to introduce our three finalists of our last competition for the Kitchen Network. And first, let's introduce contestant number one. Tell us something about yourself. Hi. Um, so, hi, my name is Lisa Prado, and I'm an artist and writer and doom scroller and Brazilian hot girl. And today, I'm here to represent toxic femininity and algorithmic heteropatriarchy. And the, I want to be the online character stay-at-home girlfriend. Um, and I want to say that I first challenged myself to join this competition as stay-at-home girlfriend because being a broke artist in this cold fascist wasteland sucks. So, yeah, and whenever I talk, all people think about or see are tits anyway. So, for this competition, I decided to ditch my academic career and reject my academic degrees and become a full-time content creator. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so, the most important thing for me is self-care, and my favorite things to eat are natural, vegan, superfood, antioxidant, nutritional supplements. Um, my boyfriend, Brandon, is in the audience. Hi, Brandon! <laughs> well, audience, family, let's hear it for contestant number one, Luisa Prado, stay-at-home girlfriend and artist! All right, well, what have we here? Do you want to introduce yourselves to our studio audience there, contestant number two? Yeah, I'm uh, Jazz Ralt, and I'm here representing toxic masculinity. So for the next two challenges, I like to be known as Manarchist Jack Black. No, nope, Jack Blam. <laughs> I'm a futurist. I'm here for big ideas, innovation, disruptive tech. My pronouns are he, him, they, them, she, her, whatever, man. <laughs> Why get so hung up on pronouns, genders of feeling, identity politics divide the class, struggle for innovative content production. Though I don't cook, uh, unless I've got a barbecue and a lot of attention, I've been into food for a very long time. I mean, I eat everything. But I'm known as a pioneer of the grilled grasshopper. 
So, Jack Blam, Manarchist Black ja <laughs> Jake Blam. <laughs> Welcome to the show. I'm really getting all of these like super like big man toxic vibes from you. I really I'm really I'm really feeling it. You need it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to contestant number 3. Oh, hi contestant number 3. Um can you just tell us what's going on with you? Who are you? Yes, Why are you hello. here? Um, yeah, hi, Aging Supermodel. Hi. So I'm Helen Pritchard, but today I'll be acting the character Queer Gardener, the writer from the Queer Composting, Digital Food Sovereignty, and Tools Substack. I'm the queer content character here representing toxic ecofeminism and flattened versions of queer ecologies that just reduce it to plant sex. Oh, I hate reduction. Yeah. But also, I'd just like to add that the producers of the Kitchen Network really wanted to expand the diversity of our panel, so they invited a queer, white, cis woman. And you're so good at yeah. it. And I'm also here as Queer Gardener to, to promote my composting substack. You can sign up to it right now. Um, I'm super into permaculture proposals. I love goddess music festivals um, and the outdoors, soil gurus, and I'm passionate about composting. Queer composting. So, so important. <laughs> Hey, um, stay-at-home girlfriend, I'm also a semi-professional vegan baker. Ooh. And today, I'm sponsored by Swiss Big Pharma, who are diversifying into herbalism. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Token queer character. I love your tool Thank belt. You. What have you got going on Thank here? You, what a beautiful model. tool belt. Created by Nanny and Friends. Nanny and Friends, yeah. wow. Hey, Aging Supermodel, I also brought one for you. No! Oh my god! <laughs> you can oh, wear it, you can promote I'm it. I'm wearing it. Oh, I love it. Oh, I might need you to help me of do it. Of course. <laughs> Get nice okay. and tight. There you go. Nice. All right. Don't you love my apron? Thank you, Claire <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, um, all together, let's welcome all of our contestants. Welcome to the contestants. <laughs> and now, let the games begin. The mystery box challenge. <laughs> Challenge one, the mystery box. Content. Today we welcome you once again to this stage for two final and very special challenges. Today, we will explore the rarest, most exotic of ingredients, those that no longer exist. That which has been extinguished by your humankind. How do you cook with ghosts? How do you wade through memory and time to find within yourselves the threads that connect you to long lost earthly relatives? How do you invoke the muscle memory of the cooks of old, chopping and whisking and transforming the matter that makes all of the living beings on earth? How do you trudge through extinction, your own pulse of life so bright, formidable and ghastly? For this first challenge, a box has been placed in each one of your stations. Underneath the boxes, you will find a series of ingredients meant to invoke inflection points in reality, moments of ending, Stories of hunger and desire. Points of change, where bifurcated paths lead us to distinct universes. From these ingredients, you'll be asked to create a recipe that is a story, or a story that is a recipe. How does one cook without fire? How do we feed the algorithm in a world where the means of content production are restricted? Let's now hand over to your brilliant judge, aging supermodel. You make us all sound so beautiful. <laughs> okay, so contestants, look in your boxes. Ooh. What's going to happen? 
Hmm. All right. A little uncomfortable Ooh. silence while our contestants rummage around and see what they've got in there. Okay. Well, this is live TV, so we cannot waste time. I am coming right over to you, contestant number one. I want to hear what you are up to. Mm. First, Louisa, okay. stay-at-home girlfriend artist. Yes. Um, can you first tell me which ingredient from the, the mystery box speaks to you, like to your soul? Oh, well, I mean, there's definitely not. Look at this. No. <laughs> um, ooh, also not this. Um, I think I'm going to keep this. This is what speaks to me the most. Um, so, yeah, I like this coin. This is a coin, um, which is actually an ancient Roman artifact. And on the face of this coin, you can see a plant which was actually known as Silphium. So let me tell you the tea on this plant because I'm totally obsessed. Um, Silphium was like this amazing superfood from like 2,000 years ago that grew around the ancient city of Cyrene in what today is Libya. And it had like all these super important uh, properties for your body. Oh and it was used in all kinds of medicine. And it was also this super hyped food. And this plant was like a whole thing in ancient Greece and Rome when all the hot girls in Athens. Mm, uh, so I probably would have had one. Yeah. OK, yeah. sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> so all the hot girls in Athens would be having like these silphium dishes. Mm -hmm. And it was like the gold leaf steak of TikTok, you know, or the gold popcorn, or the gold avocado toast on Insta, um, or the gold burger. Well, you know, the, the, the important thing is the gold. Gold. Because Got at it. some point, silphium was worth its weight in gold. And the Roman Empire was like, girl, let me keep this thing in my financial reserves <laughs> because the hype is so huge. And the city of Serene was also like, let me mint the image of this plant oh. in my coins because this species is literally money. <laughs> and yeah, is literally money. money. We love it's money. amazing. We love money. And Silphium was content. <gasps> yeah. What? Content? Money? Yeah. Okay. Because it was mentioned like in ancient Greek reels, like a play called The Birds by this content creator called Aristophanes. <laughs> and in the books also of like nature influencers like Theophrastus and Hippocrates and Pliny the Elder and food influencers too, like Marcus Apicius. <laughs> But wow. of course you're gonna be like, mm -hmm. girl, Roman mm -hmm. Empire, mm -hmm. was it worth the hype? <laughs> <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. You gotta ask that. Well, the tea is that Silphium was not just this cute superfood, it was also a contraceptive and an aphrodisiac burn. And there was like this whole thing, this whole drama around Silphium though, um, because there was like so much hype that it was actually over harvested oh. and the local farmers, the indigenous people also had beef with the Roman landlords who had taken their land. So they went and destroyed some plants. Mm -hmm. And there was also like this little kind of situation, this mm -hmm. little climate change oh, situation. Yeah going on at this time because the temperatures were rising around the Mediterranean. So it was a whole thing. And I wanted to say this because this coin really speaks to me because as a stay at home girlfriend, my job is to stay young and pretty and hot and skinny and childless online. And I want to be like the hot girls in Athens. <laughs> I really want to. They were so good. I think you're so close. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and I'm not getting pregnant until I'm married. Brendan, hi. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm not getting pregnant. And then after I'm married, then I can become a hashtag treadwife. 
living in a farmhouse full of expensive appliances with seven children and a square-jawed husband who is secretly an heir to a private jet company. So until Brandon proposes, um, yeah, I need to have a superfood natural organic contraceptive that will also clear my skin and make me less bloated. And also that can be added to my juice cleanse diet. Wow, so this ingredient sounds um, just so fascinating. And I mean, as an aging supermodel, I think I should be first in line because I yeah. really need it. Yeah, so you'll like, get me yeah, you know, yeah, connected, okay, right? Girl. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Um, so you're talking to me about things that you're um, using the Silphium for. Can you tell us about what you've made here today for us at the Food Network? Yes, so my concept for this recipe today uh, is to insert Silphium back into the content circuit. Content is over, but long live content. Um, and for this first challenge, I created this amazing Silphium supplement, which you can buy through the link in my bio. Um, in all of my socials, don't worry, you can find it anywhere. And this supplement is a natural contraceptive and aphrodisiac. Don't worry, it's also keto and paleo friendly. And it's high in antioxidants and you can just add it to like a glass of water and have it every day in the morning together with your lemon water, of course, and your other skin supplements. Oh, wow. Well, this is, this is you're really outdone yourself here. I think you're really giving huge contribution to humanity and certainly certainly to this show. Can Thank we hear you. it for contestant number one? Thank you. The first to complete the mystery box challenge. Okay, so contestant number two, Manarchist Jake Balam. <laughs> first, can you explain to me, um, what was your favorite ingredient from the mystery box? Uh, Jake Blam thought he'd invented eating insects a few years ago when he posted a surprisingly popular Instagram story about not cleaning the grill before barbecuing his steak. Hashtag protein poppers. Hashtag future meat. I created the insect crusted barbecue tofu steak. And so you can thank me, or not, for getting entogastronomy trending. Like most girlfriends, mine is vegetarian. So I had to learn to really kill a tofu steak for her. And I'm careful to make sure she gets enough protein, because really, is there anything more important? <laughs> no. Since I'm an innovator of the barbecue, hashtag grill uh, I realized that cleaning the insects off, insects off the grill is a waste of valuable protein. I know what you're thinking. Oh man, that's too gross. I would never eat tofu. <laughs> right, guys? <laughs> but seriously, we've all eaten bugs. As kids, to impress a girl. <laughs> right, guys? sometimes without knowing it, and get this. Other people still eat bugs all the time. People who have a simpler, closer, more authentic relationship to food. Those people can really teach us a lot about protein. So I did a deep dive, some intensive research, traveling everywhere studying other people. And now I'm bringing my humble discoveries to the Kitchen Network and the world. Wow, I mean, that does sound like you've done a lot of heavy lifting there, uh, Manarchist Jake Blam. I'm really, really impressed, and I think you, you really are innovating a whole new idea about food. Can you tell us what you've made? Yeah, it's been a lot. Um, I got rid of this stuff. You can get it anywhere. Insects. This might be a little over your head, aging supermodel, but I cooked up a truly world-saving dish. Future foods a grassroots, community-led blockchain microfinancing program to bring Ento protein producers and consumers together to build a bugatorium on every block in the city of every world, especially in low-income low neighborhoods, because we're all about social responsibility. We're currently in the process of clearing some ground for future feuds, for future feuds bugatoriums, which is great because there's so much empty, wasted, underdeveloped space in these neighborhoods. But mostly I'm doing this for the women, so they can source healthy proteins for their families without having to get all done up for a grocery store. Of course, on the weekends, I offer huge bugs for the guys who come home and want to serve up something really juicy on the grill for their families. Because we all know it's hard to be a great dad these days. So it's for the women and the children. 
But really, it's for the dads out there. Hey, any hardworking dads out here? Any hardworking dads in the audience? Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. It seems like you're a little uh, on your own island there. I always am. Kiss Jack, Jake Black. I'm always the leading edge, you guys. Yeah, you really are. You're really one of a kind. I'm hey? all right. I'm all right. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, good luck, buddy. And um, Don't need it. Oh, yeah, okay. All right, okay. <laughs> All right, don't feel bad about yourself. <laughs> okay, so, hi, friend, hi. Queer Gardener. Um, can you tell me what your favorite yeah. ingredient is in the mystery box? Okay, Aging Supermodel. So the one that just whispered, when I listened, deep listened, queer to me, mm -hmm. was this one. Oh. And, and this plant, this greeny leaf-shaped plant, and correct me if I'm wrong, aging supermodel, oh, I is the dock plant. Oh. It's a very promiscuous plant. Oh. It's a herbal wonder, sometimes known as fire leaves, mm -hmm. or white man's foot, or white man's footsteps, oh. or English man's foot. Oh. So I'm choosing it. Um, but I'm not going to walk in any cis man's footsteps. Oh, I hear you, sister. And I just love this slutty little plant. <laughs> oh, I'm really, I'm really impressed with what you're bringing to our show. I think it, it just, it's so generative and generous. And it just really makes me feel um, so um, in touch with the land, right? Um, so can you tell me what you've made with this slutty little plant? I can. I've been just whipping up something here with my tool belt. Oh. You know, whilst everyone else is just been on the discourse. Oh, of course, oh. of course, but you've been working. I've been material practice. Material practice. Yeah. Yeah. My hands in the earth. The hands in the yeah. earth. Working with in relation to, right? Like, are you having... Relation a, with relation. Yeah. With right. some entangled relation. Okay, okay, yeah? okay. Okay. Okay, so, okay, so it is kind of topical. It's a topical recipe. Oh, and by topical, is it something that I can use on my skin? Like, is it uh, anti-aging, maybe? You don't need that. Oh, thank you. don't need you. that. I mean, embrace the wrinkles, right? Oh, I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, no, what I mean, it's a herbal balm. Oh, a balm. Herbal okay. balm. And it's a first aid content kit for the online-only actions, protests, only online occupations and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can already subscribe to my substrat stack if you want the recipe. Okay. Um, and if you want to tool up against state violence and be a good ally. Oh, right. I mean, here at the Kitchen Network, we really value allies. Um, are there any allies in the audience? Any allies in the studio audience? Woo! Oh, Ooh. Kitchen Gardener, I think you're really a hit with the allies. Amazing, amazing. Okay, so, uh, gar uh, our kitchen chefs, you may want to... Uh, move some of these materials over uh, on your table because we are about to do challenge number two, our final challenge. Challenge two, the fairy stew. Contestants. You will now face our final and most difficult challenge yet, the Fairy Stew. You have three minutes to gather ingredients from our theoretical pantry and place these items into your crates. The ingredients you gather from the pantry must be used along with the ingredients you found in the mystery box to create your final dish, the Fairy Stew. In this final dish, you will be asked to articulate new and old ingredients, effectively creating a new narrative, a new story, a new recipe. It is in this clash of old and new that reality emerges, a present in constant flux, a garden of endless paths. Your stew needs to be compelling and balanced, pleasing to the eye as well as to the ears. Your stew must captivate the tongue, entice the taste buds of our viewers so that they too feel like they've tasted your creations. Remember, truth is the currency. And now over to you, Judge. Thank you again, timeless host. 
Well, this is, this is a real challenge, I would say, a real timeless challenge. So who doesn't love? I mean, we think stew is easy, but I think we're going to think more critically about stews here um, on, on these three tables. I mean, who doesn't love the easy, cozy comfort of a warming stew? made out of whatever you have available to you in your culture or your historical time and the real conditions of your life. A stew is a materiality matrix of flavors, isn't it? Mm-hmm, I think that that's what we're aiming for. Contestants, this is your ultimate challenge, to create the perfect one-pot meal. We have stocked the theory pantry over there, um, with items that you can grab um, from anything that you want, from your own court culture or any culture you want to steal from. We have a lot of things that you can just <laughs> grab if you need them, if they suit your lifestyle. Um, so I now invite you to step into the theory pantry, collect your items, and return to your tables. Um, you have three minutes. Now? Now. Oh my god. <laughs> exactly. So, my little contestants, how is your theory challenge going? So, as our contestants are back at their tables, I want to remind our audience um, that, and our family, our Kitchen Network family, um, that in this challenge, our contestant chefs will be able to use ingredients from the mystery box challenge together with items they could source from the pantry to create their theory stew. The challenge here is for contestants to explain to us the big ideas that flavor their dishes. Why have they chosen the items that they have used? And which tools have they used to work to make the theory stew? And so we're going to mix it up a little bit. And I'm going to begin by talking to my cute friend over there, the queer gardener. So, queer gardener, can you tell me what did you throw into your theory pot and what kind of stew have you made for us today? Okay, well, I'm still working on the stew, mm -hmm. but I feel like from the pantry that I just needed one thing. Okay. One thing, but also together with my own tools that I brought oh, and my right. own because, you know, couldn't supply the whole thing here. Right. Um, so I have my heart-shaped carabiner, <sighs> I have my teapot, but I also have my... Only permaculture preppers, oh, queer yeah. ecofeminism. Oh, absolutely. So necessary, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. 
But maybe actually we might need some HP sources, and okay. I might need to divert out of the queer gardener okay. for a minute, okay. for a hot minute. Okay. okay. So Helen Pritchard, welcome to the stage. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So maybe I feel like the queer gardeners in Tangled Soup. It wants to be all about this soft trauma healing and plant love. Um, both of which are amazing, actually. Um, but through the content generation on their Substack, um, all of these kind of engagements that they have across their platforms, there's this kind of mundane creep of a kind of trendy ecofeminism mm. and an ecofeminism content um, full of these kind of like food sovereignty proposals, which gets completely flattened as they circulate online. Um, and their kind of obsession with spreading these queer ecologies, these kind of queer plant sex ecologies into the cloud, in a way just extends this long tail of extraction of the soil and water that they're continually trying to regenerate. Um, and their digital and food sovereignty interests end up as a kind of like weird version of like a vegetal nationalism or a kind of conservationist practice a kind of imaginary of this kind of purest permaculture future. And of course, also her eco-feminist flattenings of that mm -hmm. means she's kind of just accidentally obsessed with the flavors of biological essentialism. Ooh. <laughs> All of which feed the ecocidal fantasies of social media, which is the antithesis of queer life. So instead, what I've brought from the pantry for the queer gardener to add into her soup that might kind of help, um, that might help her rethink um, her affinity to ecofeminists and the promises of a kind of permaculture prepodum, and instead use her amazing tool belt that she already has. Mm. Um, she just needs to find those tools, um, and all of those tools to be able to fight a more hearty, transfeminist, insurgent, intersectional plant practice in a soup, um, and so I want to add to her soup, I have two things. Um, first of all, I want to add um, two things from the, that would have been in the anti-colonial panel last night. Mm, nice. okay, okay, so the first thing I want to add is the abolition geographies of Ruth Wilson Gilmore. I think that's gonna help her a lot in thinking about soil practices beyond borders, and also that we need to kind of just think about our way, abolition is our way through those soils. And then the second thing that I want to add is the poetry book from uh, Cassandra Troyan's poetry collection, Against <laughs> Capture. Um, so she can steal back her leisure time and commit to a trans-species solidarity. Um, and also in addition, what I'm gonna add in here from my teapot is the amazing community uh, organizers, like people like Herbalism Against Borders, um, trans-feminist herbalists who are practicing um, for many, many years um, and opting for building the future from the present in all the ways that we can. So thank well, you. thank you very much, Helen Pritchard and Queer Gardener. <laughs> I mean, one of the things I think as judge, I just have to say, like, not only did you bring so much to your stew, but I really believe the way that you blended your online persona and yourself <laughs> as an amazing um, media scholar and um, revolutionary um, plant lover. Um, I really love the way you blended all of those. I feel like you really used a stew methodology to, um, to really pull this all together. And I, I just want to say, as a judge, I think you, I think you did a great job. But aging really. supermodel, yes. is it an entangled stew? It, it could be, an, I think like it is. Like a isn't, soup, like an entangled, entangled soup. soup? Maybe if you put some noodles in, It'll tangle it up a little like more. Like a string, like a set of strings. Yeah. Tangled like, together uh -huh, in an entangled suit. Uh -huh. And then also some string theory. Mm, yeah, I love it, love it. I think love that that's it. what you need. Like if you could have the noodles, you know, like a broth, like a stew on top of noodles, but if the noodles were string theory, I think you're gonna have a very entangled stew. Yeah, I think you might, think you can so. keep working on it. Okay, keep working I keep on working, it. I keep okay, working. Okay, let's hear it for the theory stew from <laughs> Helen Pritchard and the Queer Gardener. 
Okay, moving on to contestant number two. So, Manarchist, Jake Blam. Jake Blam. <laughs> what did you casually throw into your theory pot, and what kind of stew have you made for us today? Listen, aging supermodel, we all know what Manarchist theory stew <laughs> looks like and tastes like. It's, <laughs> it's creamy white, mostly stale, dying. Once you've acquired a taste for it, it makes you feel invincibly self-important and like a real leader. As everyone knows about me, I'm too busy for mundane domestic cooking and specialize in barbecued ento gastro grill mm -hmm. uh, So a stew is a little below my skill set. Um, I chose some of my staples, some cornstarch, some potato powder, uh, some flavor because you can't have a meal with our barbecue sauce, right guys? And of course, well, they're all blended in there. Of course, some insects for protein. We can't have a oh, meal without yeah, protein. I really believe that, that you've got a message there. My future food protein for substance. I whipped up a radically new take on a housewifey standard. Uh, my, uh, <coughs> Mm. I, my, my paper notes just couldn't keep up with the, the rapidity of my thoughts, so I, have to, I had to write some down here. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, not, yeah. I'm actually just a little bit too quick for the production of this show. Yeah, I mean, the voice memo can't keep up with you. No, I no. know, I know. I, I understand, so I understand. My, You're faster than all of us. My Manarchist Theory to do is great, because after a bowl of it, you feel truly empowered to always ask the first and the longest question slash comment at any event. To explain to any speaking woman, this is important, uh, what she probably meant to say but was too insecure to really articulate. Yeah, I'm hoping you'll do that for me later. I've been, yeah. I've been um, taking some notes, notes yeah. to, okay. to tell Great. you backstage. Manarchist Theory Stew helps you model confidence. I've learned so much about cooking, ecocidal racism, heterocolonial white supremacy from feminist, indigenous, queer, trans, black, and critical race studies. So I'm using volumes uh, 1 to 10,000 of dead white guy theory to honor my elders. Um, I'm also using alive white guy petrocultural studies. Um, and I've got some really important great guy theory. Uh, you actually can't have a stew without it. Rather than engaging or citing scholars like Max Liberon, Pollution is Colonialism, or Edward Said on almost anything with colonialism as a land grab, or Debelina Roy on anti-racist feminist molecular biology, see molecular feminisms, or Tiffany Lothabo King's work in the Black Shoals, tracing lines of connection and affiliation between black and indigenous environment, land-based expertise, and surviving and resisting genocidal colonialism, we haven't heard about it. Manarchist Jack Blam thinks those are great special interest studies. Um, that can help for some people, but if you want big ideas with a broader reach that can apply to everyone, Jack Blam doesn't recognize that everyone means white guys, we need to turn to volumes 1 to 10,000 uh, that I have here, that everybody should have, um, where we can see a non-stop investment in white futures as the only viable future, the only content to save all of us, again, by which he means white people, um, from the apocalypse, which, of course, Colonialism has enacted again and again and again, and white people are just really late to catching up on. So, Jack Blam has the best stew. Yeah, I would say that, I mean, I feel so explained to. Thank you so much. Like, I feel like so, like, nourished by all of the information that you've talked at me. I think your face needed my talking at it. Thank you, thank you. I mean, let's hear it for Manarchist Jake Blam. I mean, really, got to get some of that confidence, Stu. Okay, so for our number one um, contestant, um, I want to ask you, um, you know, just a very simple question. Um, Louise Prado, stay-at-home home girlfriend artist, what did you throw into your theory pot, and what kind of a stew have you made for us today? Ooh, I'm still working on it, but like, I'm, as a stay-at-home girlfriend, I decided to create more like a thin broth rather than a stew, um, because stay-at-home girlfriend felt very empowered to put a lot of feminist theory in the blender, just like so. Just rip it up, stuff it all in here, 
2020s, 1980s. You can also add a little bit of Tumblr feminism too. That also works. Um, and I want to make like this thinner broth because like I want to put all of this in the blender and kind of strain all the fiber oh, out yeah. of it. Um, we don't need that much feminist fiber in our diet these days because right. um, yeah. that also makes you so bloated and it's not cute. Yeah, so um, just tell me just a little bit more detail. Um, which feminist theory did you put into your blender? Oh, all I'm of them. So, oh. All of them. It doesn't matter. All of them. <coughs> um, you can just blend them all together to make this broth. And the recipe is like really easy and flexible. You can make it, like I said, you know, with whatever you have on hand. Even Camille Paglia will do. Um, and then, uh, as stay-at-home girlfriend, mm -hmm. I also um, thought I would like garnish oh, this so stew yeah. with a few keywords that I think add the kind of flavor that we need today. You know, like intersectionality, for instance, <laughs> for a little bit of flavor, a little bit of spice, um, which, you know, when we talk about intersectionality, this is really about all the flavors like meeting and understanding each other and like <laughs> influencing each other, right? Um, so I also added choice because this I think is like super important and I really believe in like my choice to be a stay-at-home girlfriend because it makes me feel so valued to be taken care of you know mm -hmm. you know um, I just love stay-at-home girlfriend I love so much the way that you take these you know complex feminist ideas about specific topics and located ideas and I love the way that you just like blend them up all together and like take all of the real flavor out of them and then just make feminism taste like super thin and bland. I mean I think that you've really really you're really on to something here and I mean I also am just fascinated by this blender that just like makes it possible to take like all of the meaning out of feminism. It's totally amazing. I think that you've got like, you're using your tools well, you're using so many ingredients, and then you're gonna, then you're gonna just filter out all the feminist fiber. I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled by this idea. I can't, I can't even decide what could possibly be better than this. Can I tell you a secret? Please. I'm working on a feminist supplement. Too. You're working on a feminist supplement. Link in bio. Ooh, okay. And so, audience fam, please give a huge round of appreciation for these three panelists, our three contestants. I think you've all just done such great work, and now we're going to move on to the final act, the judgment. So, fam, audience, what do you think? What do you think about our contestants? What do you think about our show? And you know, because I am the one and only judge. And I know I'm gonna be unpopular for this, but please don't unfollow me, because I'm timeless. <sighs> Probably you would all realize that if this were a really, really real reality show, we would enter into the final challenge and we would crown one contestant with the title of Kitchen Master, and we would eliminate the other contestants off the planet in order to make one single winner. But because we're all anti-colonial feminist media and performance studies uh, scholars, um, we don't believe in eliminating people. And so, <laughs> um, we don't agree with eliminating people, 
Um, not one person, not two people. We don't believe in eliminating a whole group of people off of an area of land. Um, we just don't agree with eliminating people. We don't think that you should just vote people away. And so um, we realize that even with the warish norms of reality TV and the, 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 the real pressure it puts on us, um, even and especially people in a historically adversational, adversarial relationship to each other, um, we're just not going to do that. We're not going to do any of the eliminating. So rather, what we're going to do is please um, have our volunteers come and clear the tables, and we're going to join each other on the couches and talk to each other about our our ideas, but don't worry, no one gets eliminated. So we're gonna do genre change talk show. All right, let's start the talk show. Well, where did Aging Supermodel go? Now we've got my frequent collaborator, professor and performance artist, T.L. Cowan on the stage with us. Hi! <laughs> All right, let's get started with our conversation amongst um, uh, uh, contestants, scholars, and artists who may flip back and forth between persona. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about the evolution of our collaboration or the form it took here. Luisa, you were the motor behind this production and really led us by devising all of the structural and so much of the conceptual content of what we were thinking through today. So can you talk about why we decided to make a reality contest show rather than a regular panel conversation? Yes. So. Well, first of all, because I'm obsessed with reality TV and especially with food competitions. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, it's a kind of obsession that I take seriously because I think it speaks so much about what we're living. Uh, and this first started, this whole project first started with the residency that I did at Transmediale uh, in August and September last year. And in this residency, I kind of used that obsession to access, I think, um, different angles. I had been researching this plant, Silphium, for a while. It's a plant that, yeah, went extinct 2,000 years ago. Um, and I had first, first come across it in my PhD research when I was looking into articulations and relationships between uh, colonial structures of power and the control over reproduction um, and technologies that emerge around that. And for obviously, you know, when you see a plant that is a contraceptive, an aphrodisiac, a spice, because in my artistic practice, I'm also interested in food. So all those things, it kind of checks all the boxes <laughs> of stuff that I'm interested in. And <laughs> it was already in itself, I think, a fascinating story. But then in 2021, a group of researchers from Istanbul University published a paper saying that this legendary plant that disappeared for 2,000 years, they said, we think we found the plant. So that's when I was like, no, I, I need to do several projects about this. This <laughs> is too crazy. Um, and. Um, the relationship between this plant and uh, these very contemporary formats uh, where food becomes commodity, in becoming content becomes commodity, to me there's such a clear bridge between the fact that this was a plant that was literally worth its weight in gold, that was kept in the financial reserves of the Roman Empire, and that um, kind of encapsulated or materialized this transition of food from uh, something that belongs to a commons into a commodity. Um, when we think about that through, uh, through a contemporary lens, 
that to me is very clear in how food becomes a commodity through content, through becoming content. Nice. So that's kind of where I was going with this. Mm -hmm. And then I think, so we um, worked, so we have never collaborated together before, the four <laughs> of us. Um, we had never met in person <laughs> before, um, but um, in conversation um, between uh, Luisa and Helen and some of the Transmediale team, um, they brought Jazz and I over um, to um, do this wonderful experiment. And at some point we were like, are we just gonna do, I think I might have said it in a judgy voice. Um, I think I said, are we just gonna do like a regular panel? And everyone was like, no, absolutely not. And then this happened. Yeah. Um, and so it was a little more maybe than we uh, bargained for. But um, one of the things for me that, um, I'm not a huge uh, reality TV person, um, I 100% uh, because I get too stressed out when people are getting voted off. Um, and, <laughs> and then it really made me think, and I'm sure other media studies theorists have made this connection, but one of the things I was really thinking about in our current time um, was the way that TV, like game shows like Survivor and um, even the British Bake Off and all of these other shows just normalize eliminating people. And people, if you don't, um, if you don't make it through the first round, if you don't have the most followers, if you're not algorithmically um, destined to stay in the show, <laughs> you get deplatformed. And, um, and so I was just thinking about using the idea of the reality, or we were thinking about using the idea of the reality show um, uh, as a way to kind of rethink um, the normalization of elimination, the elimination of one person, of two people, of a whole group of people, a whole group of people who've been, uh, who have been or are being eliminated, uh, you know, in reality television shows around the world. Um, and so um, that was one of the things that I really wanted us to be able to think about through this format while also talking about or on top of um, our, our scholarly and artistic work. <laughs> And I know that when I was, you know, first starting to talk to Louisa and Helen about this, and we were, you know, in only, I don't know, we've been joking about like only 85 short organizing hours, uh, we pulled this collaboration together. And at the beginning, I was uh, not sure what in my research spoke specifically to, you know, contemporary food cultures and various practices of. Uh, you know, for lack of a better word, uh, colonial ecocidal practices. Um, but I have been very compelled by a long history of the connection between uh, kitchens, food, and media within feminist organizing. And you know, so I think about the Kitchen Table Press, which was a woman of color, women of color press, started in 1980 by Barbara Smith, along with a, a, a bunch of collaborators. Right, Audre Lorde. Uh, Cherry Morega was involved, Jewel Gomez, Gloria Hull, uh, I have a couple names written down here, Cheryl Clark, right? They started publishing in 1980 to be able to uh, make, as they put it, like a, a press of their own, a room of their own, a press of their own, um, in recognizing that in order to tell uh, feminist and lesbian anti-racist stories, uh, they needed to own the means of media production, right? This was a U.S. example. Thank you very much for pointing that out. Yeah. So this was started in, in the U.S. They published this bridge called My Back in 1983, and they were really revolving around and invested in the idea of a networked, mediated uh, women of color feminism, right? One that would be a transnational network of mediated presses, um, radio shows, uh, et cetera, right? So there's been a long history of putting the kitchen and cooking at the center of kind of media attention to... Uh, trans, feminist, queer, anti-racist organizing. Yeah. And I'm sure, like, we don't have, like, you and I are from Canada and worked in the U.S. and don't necessarily know offhand some of the kind of, kind of kitchen methods, um, publishing, media production, et cetera, that goes on in the parts of the worlds that you're all from. So that would be something that um, we, you know, would love to hear about at some point, too. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, also a lot, right? We, we spoke about this idea, or we were joking earlier, like, it's like when you um, book a 6 a.m. flight, or when I do, and then I, the night before, I'm like, 
oh my God, who, wh what kind of person did I think I was that I'm going to make that 6 a.m. flight? <laughs> and after every kind of uh, call with Louisa, I was like, yes, I want to be in your theatre troupe forever, Louisa. I'm leaving my job. It's my trans feminist future. <laughs> and then the next day, like, mm, there's some limitations of a nerdy academic. <laughs> um, but I think, I mean, I think there's also like this commitment, right, to the vulnerabilities um, and actually what it means to perform like accurately in this space, like especially in these kind of spaces in terms of like, the particular type of like really secure knowledge practices that in a way all of this content generation is just kind of concretizing. Like the manichaeist who can in, a th in three sentences, you know, um, co-opt uh, like kind of hundreds of years of um, <laughs> black feminist and anti-colonial writing. Um, and like what does it mean to actually kind of try and inhabit a less secure performance of something? Um, but also I think like in terms, and I think this was something also that we had some discussions with Nora about in terms of like the flattening of these discourses. Like even with the queer gardener, right, there's so many things about queer ecology and um, composting I really love, like dearly love, and dearly love like the medicinal properties of plants and these things. But that kind of flattening process that happens in that circulation. Um, and I think um, it was Nora who said, you know, like who are the winners right now, right? Who are the winners in this kind of circulation of content? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do you want to ask the next question, Helen? Okay, yeah, that's the uh, that's the next thing on the script, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but let's talk about the characters um, mm. as content. Um, and who wants to start? Um, I'm happy to start um, as aging supermodel because. Um, uh, I'm going to make a bit of a manarchist statement here um, to say I think I was the first aging supermodel. <laughs> I've never been a supermodel, um, but I certainly am aging. Um, and um, many years ago in my performance practice, I was starting to, to um, experiment with, and mostly my performance practices on cabaret stages and in, you know, durational performance art. And I've used a persona or alter ego based performance for a very long time. And one of the things that um, I think is a, a cabaret method that's really important to me is basically like, who do I need to be in order to say the kinds of things I want to say? And, um, and also trying to engage critically with femininity um, so that not all white women are only expected to be fucking horrible apolitical idiots. Um, and, uh, and instead thinking about a figure like the aging supermodel and how she might just, you know, blow up the expectations and say, um, you know, something revolutionary. And so for her whole career, she's been around with me for like 25 years, she's always been this like kind of um, like lesbian feminist poet revolutionary, you know, loves to go to rallies. Um, she wrote the Glitter Festo, you know, all of these things. So it's really thinking about what, what's, what, does this, what does an alter ego m make it possible for you to say um, that you feel like you wouldn't be able to communicate effectively in your, you know, kind of everyday skin. Um, and so when we were talking about this, I was like, well, I've got this aging supermodel character. We could probably do something with her. And then it kind of snowballed from there. Um, yeah, and I think, um, yeah, you have some, you're also thinking about um, alter egos and, and um, I think, yeah. Yeah, to me, when I started thinking about, well, in the Transmediala residency, um, my initial proposal was to, develop a film that has become also sort of like a play, as <laughs> we did a first run or a first experiment today. Um, but I started thinking about what would be the characters that would be present in, in something like this, you know. Um, if I'm thinking about this plant that disappeared and is back, if I'm thinking about food as content, if I'm thinking about all of this, what is the character that I would like also to play and to explore within this context? And what, what would be a character that works sort of as a container for a lot of the concerns that are driving me here, that are driving me in this research? And 
I ended up landing on this figure of the stay-at-home girlfriend, which is a thing that took off on TikTok um, in the past, uh, in the recent past. And to me, this figure is really, really fascinating because one, it feels, you know, since we're talking about coins and I brought the Silphium coin here today, uh, the stay-at-home girlfriend to me feels like the other side of the incel coin in terms of um, thinking about um, these repackagings of like extremely conservative understandings of gender and sexuality. And I feel that these figures, the stay-at-home girlfriend, the trad wife, um, these are for me the, the like currently such um, significant um, representations of toxic femininity online. And that these characters, because they are so easy to reproduce, they feel almost like a way of um, characters that are meant for, I'm thinking like of algorithmic dispersion, mm -hmm. kind of like seeds, you know, like a toxic mm -hmm. fucking seed that mm -hmm. you throw <laughs> out into the world and it can uh, take root and it actually can create a lot of damage. So I'm thinking about that in, in those terms. Mm -hmm. I also think so often like as media studies and performance studies scholars, we, se we, we, we spend a lot of time like talking at and about these online archetypes. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I find really fun about what we've all done is that it's actually more interesting to embody those archetypes and have them say something that's completely beyond their discourse. Because I think for, we can say, you know, online archetypes flatten discourse because people become extremely limited in what they can say based on who, they're, that who they've self-branded to be. But if we put on those, those archetypes and perform you know, this kind of reality t TV cabaret and you have something completely unexpected coming out of the mouths of these different, the men are kissed, the stay-at-home girlfriend, the aging supermodel, the queer token gardener, the garden, the garden token queer, the <laughs> queer token <laughs> garden, <laughs> the entangled string theory gardener, um, that for me is more compelling and more fun to watch in the context of a festival, especially that's blending media and performance and theory. So for me, that's kind of interesting. What about your character, Helen? Mm. So I'm actually having to like kind of wriggle around the sofa in case I sit on a very sharp pair of scissors, <laughs> multiple <laughs> other weapons. <laughs> I think there's like a hammer. I just actually found my eggs here as well. <laughs> um, and yes, I will be continuing to wear the tool belt all year. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah, I think there's like this, um, you know, in terms of like how these kind of um, like queer ecology practices or these kind of like perma imaginings of the futures or this kind of like prefigurative politics of like how to d deal with like struggle and resistance that kind of do end up circulating um, on, on social media. You know, in some ways there's a kind of imaginary that there's like, there is an, um, that there's an, uh, an environmental outside to that big tech, mm. um, which of course, like, you know, and it's nothing new that I'm saying, right, but, you know, of course, there is no environmental outside to that. There is no militarized outside to that. Um, there is no capitalist outside to that. Um, and I think that that's, you know, it's kind of like, and I mean, of course, this is also how we met through um, the amazing special issue that you did on metaphors, but <laughs> kind of like, what are those other metaphors in some ways that um, might be able to kind of open up other possibilities? Like, um, and I was thinking of Stephanie Dixon's work with the glittery spinning okras mm -hmm. um, that tell these like super kind of complex stories that are just not possible to circulate um, as a kind of like sexy queer meme <laughs> <laughs> online. Although I do love sexy queer memes as well. <laughs> um, but also I, I think like also some of these things too, right, that are like, really this kind of creep that we see in eco-fascism mm -hmm. um, in terms of, um, and especially, and my colleague, Laura uh, Prager, was actually saying to me, like, during COVID, you know, that kind of creep and coalition of the kind of brown and green ideologies, especially, um, that is kind of, we need to be kind of continuously kind of watchful for, right? And we need, we need all the tools in some ways. Um, and I think it's, it, there's a, that flattening 
um, in the circulation also kind of often fl flattens that out. And actually, when we were preparing for this panel, I kind of um, I ended up almost accidentally, but with so much pleasure, watching Shuli Chung's 90s film, um, Fresh mm. Kills, about the trending uh, sushi fish lips um, restaurant um, and the kind of resistance and struggle against um, an evil cat food um, company who is like polluting um, the kind of city of New York. Um, and I was kind of amazed in a way, like re watching that, of this kind of like the duration of that film. And like the, like the duration of that temporality that is needed to bring together like the threads of like queer feminist practice, the threads of like um, anti-colonial practice or critique of capitalism, together with also this kind of thread of like toxicity, but also jokes about queer toxicity, um, thinking about trends, thinking about fashion. And that actually like, you know, a two hour feature film is the kind of length, right? And the kind <laughs> of, the real, right, just ends up like being such a condensed version of that. Your gardener needs a two-hour feature film. I hear it. <laughs> yes, I heard that. You can contact me on my Substack. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, my character is the easiest uh, character. That manarchist uh, just keeps coming back and back and back, uh, whether it be uh, online or through any of our universities uh, since the beginning of universities. So it really is just about <laughs> the sort of un apparently unquenchable desire that we cultivate through all kinds of infrastructures of knowledge and knowledge circulation for, uh, you know, innovative white masculinity and, and the, the outsized attention that white masculinity gets for recycling really boring old ideas, right? And, and, uh, and that sort of ungrounded, unfounded <laughs> mediocrity uh, or ungrounded confidence that is just mediocrity circulating with like big applause. Um, yeah. And so I think that, you know, there's something about social media that allows that particular kind of white uh, masculinity to circulate both within, you know, assigned male at birth bodies and definitely not. Um, but it is not uh, in any way specific to our particular social media moments, right? We have a testament of many, many, many archives and libraries to the fascination we have for the ideas, um, the mostly boring, recycled ideas of white masculinity. And then when they find a good idea and they steal it, that's even better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they get even more attention for that. Yeah. So yeah, mine, was, mine is a pretty easy one to uh, embody, and I think the challenge for uh, making fun of that char manarchist character is to, you know, you want to make them a little bit more nuanced, you want to make them a little bit, you know, kind of better, but it's like, oh no, God, they're just bad. They just <laughs> keep being bad. And uh, so, you know, just trying to stay in that grotesque space. Yeah. That's, that was my big challenge, my big acting challenge. <laughs> um, okay, awesome. Oh, we are very getting close. Are we getting close yeah. to our time? Yes. We are. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess, I mean, I am hearing something from, in my hearing piece Well, here. just wait, no, why, no, why are we? I think we have some. I think we have time to, for just to talk yeah. a little bit about why we're here. Okay, yeah. During these yeah. times, why do we mm -hmm. think it's important to be specifically here um, from our various different positions. TL, do mm -hmm. you want to talk a little bit about that? I mean, I could, you know, like one of the things I was thinking about in terms of, you know, do we, um, do we come to this stage? Do we come to this country? All of these things. Um, and thinking about all of the different ways that um, we can um, demonstrate our commitment to um, global social justice mm -hmm. um, and uh, and one of the things as we were talking about it as a group and we were listening to each other about like okay are we going to do this are we not going to do this and one of the things that I that came, became very clear to me is that collectively we were articulating something that um, made a lot of sense to me as something called a, that I would call like a complex yes not a yes um, we don't give a shit about anything else but a yes 
we're here because we do care and we want to have these conversations and, and we want to figure out how to do it in um, innovative ways. <laughs> um, so and for I think me, that, that was one of the things I was thinking about was this complex yes. And TL and I, you know, coming from the context of settler colonial violence in Canada, um, there's no way to be able to separate talking about food, food politics, um, networks of food uh, without thinking through the genocidal practices uh, uh, of violence against people, groups of people, um, but also land theft, uh, land destruction, um, and land poisoning, which may sound familiar around something else, but I'm talking about Canada. Um, <laughs> And uh, <laughs> yeah, we're talking about yeah. it in the Canadian context. In the Canadian context. So we're coming both from the perspective of settlers in Canada um, who are in solidarity with Indigenous resurgence movements in Canada and um, thinking about our participation here as also kind of coming as non-innocent participants, but as ones that are very much impl implicated in, um, responsible to, and accountable to um, the, um, yeah, the f uh, freedom and liberation um, in Canada of um, long, um, long um, held uh, state violence. Yeah, mm -hmm. in and Canada. In Canada. Oh, but we're getting a I, we're getting a. Getting a note. I, didn't feel, I was. I feel like there's something going on in the world at this time. No. Mm, what that is? We're not talking was there about something that we're not talking about. There's yeah? something in the world are, right are now. Are we missing something here? Are we missing something? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. You guys, we're getting a signal from the from is the sponsors. Is there something? We talked going about. No, we're getting a signal from the sponsors. Uh, our time is up. Oh, the sponsors. The no, the sponsors. No, the sponsors are. Uh, the sponsors. What is the sponsors it? are, are we, saying oh, that so, our time is oh, up. Okay, oh, so we just don't. Um, yes. We're not, we're not going to talk anymore. <laughs> and stay on stage, we're going to roll the credits. I think we're going to, are we rolling the credits? Oh! Thank you, thank you, thank you. And really, Louisa pulled this thing together. Louisa was our divisor, our leader. <laughs> our Google Doc maker, our ideas maker, and <laughs> she just, you just kept going, and we were like, we really believe in this, but we <laughs> are so lazy. <laughs> so anyhow, thank you, thank Lisa, you for devising this. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.